American poet, uh, Mr. David White, lives up off in Seattle, one of the islands there. This one's called Sweet Darkness. Sweet Darkness. When your eyes are tired, the world is tired also. When your vision has gone, no part of the world can find you. Time to go into the dark where the night has eyes to recognize its own. There you can be sure you are not beyond love. The dark will be your womb tonight. The night will give you a horizon further than you can see. You must learn one thing. The world was made to be free in. Give up all the other worlds except the one to which you belong. Sometimes it takes darkness and sweet confinement of your aloneness to learn anything or anyone that does not bring you alive is too small for you. Sometimes it takes darkness and a sweet confinement of your loneliness to learn anything or anyone that does not bring you alive is too small for you. Sweet darkness. We know from the story of creation um, that there's always been dark and light dark and light. We experience this psychologically from a depth perspective. Inside us, there's what we might call darkness and light. We speak about positive and negative emotions. So you get the picture. There's always this and that. And when we're very young, our parents and our teachers use this and that to play off each other. This is right. This is wrong. This is up. This is down. It's a way... A uh, first level of understanding reality or humanity, maybe even a bit about God, but it's not the last word. We now understand that there's a bit of light in darkness and a bit of darkness in light, and that both need each other. I remember talking to an artist who uh, specializes in uh, ink drawings, where he uses black ink, and he said, What makes a black and white photo or artistic piece beautiful is not the light, it's the darkness. It's the darkness. Something else I found from somebody who's an expert in this field is that creation doesn't grow in light, it grows in darkness. Photosynthesis happens in the light, but the actual growth, physical growth, happens in darkness. And so it is in the spiritual life. All growth happens in darkness. It's why so many great mystics, when they experience darkness, darkness of the senses, darkness of the soul, darkness of the spirit, at first they're scared to death, and rightfully so, because they're letting go of the known. But as they allow themselves to be immersed in it, they begin to find at some mystical level darkness is our friend. That's what David White's talking about. So if you can think back to the times when you felt depressed, deeply alone, maybe deeply afraid, or the aftermath of somebody's death, or the fear of, of losing either your life or your health until the doctor said, here's what you have. Okay? James Hillman who's been called the father of archetypal psychology, says, an illness suffers most until it's named correctly. Would you agree with that? <laughs> Think of when you, you were sick and didn't know what it was. You go to the doctor and say, oh my gosh, am I dying? You know, feels like it. Oh, you had the flu. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So darkness at some level is part of the gift of being a creature in this reality. The fact that you can discern the difference between dark and light. And again, if you go back to being children, remember what it was like when you were a child and you couldn't quite see in the dark. You get scared. And so your imagination began to play on you. You thought there were monsters under your bed or hiding in your closet, etc. All right? We can still do that as adults. We get afraid of the unknown until somebody says, here's your problem. Oh, thank God you can fix it. Okay? 
Or here's what's happening. Oh, that makes sense. There's a yearning within us to be comfortable. And that's a good thing. But if the yearning and the need to be comfortable outweighs the need to be fully human, fully alive, then we are selling ourselves short. At some level, we are to become bridges between opposites. We are to make friends with things that are paradoxical, things that don't make sense, the unknown. This is all hidden under the image of darkness. Darkness. I had the privilege uh, during one of my trips to go to Mexico. And I was, this was many years ago when I was studying Spanish and Mexican culture. And uh, uh, the folks I was staying with took me to this, this huge, very famous uh, cave. And uh, of course, they delighted in doing this with anybody who came to visit them. They take me to the cave, go to the flashlight, and they turn the flashlight off and wouldn't give me one. And it was pitch dark. You ever been in a cave like that? No. You can't even see your hand right in front of you. You can feel it, sense the presence, but you can't see it. It's frightening. Because then you start thinking, your mind goes every which way. It's like, oh my God, I'm not going to make it out of here and get lost. You know, you feel like a blind person going around. So yes, there is a, a normal need to see clearly. But faith, faith is seeing even in the darkness. It's knowing there's a presence here. Even though I can't, quote, see that presence, I know there's a presence. It's a loving presence. It's the Creator teaching us that even when it's dark, even when it feels unsafe, even when it feels like we've been abandoned, God is there. God is there. Forgive me for sharing from my own life, but um, I'm sharing this with you because you've been so wonderfully gracious and generous and faithful in praying for my, my niece Elizabeth. As you know, she passed away. But a couple of stories from her last days of dying. Uh, just a wonderful young lady, I mean, way beyond her years. And I'm sure the darkness of her suffering helped to kind of fructify that as well. But as you might imagine, uh, her parents just went through purgatory um, with so many questions and doubts and just feeling like failures. What did we do wrong? This happened to us. Asking all the questions any parent would ask. You know, is God punishing us? You know, because we, didn't, we missed Mass on Sunday. We all go through this stuff. You know, it's only afterwards you realize that was pretty silly. That was short-sighted. But when you're in the middle of it, it's understandable because we revert back to our childhood fears in the face of darkness. And as you know, the greatest fear that human beings have is the darkness of death. What's beyond it? So that's the template. So anyways, um, I, uh, by the request of my brother, he asked me from the bottom of his heart, he said, Jim, I, I know you're busy, but could you find it in your heart and your schedule to be with us during this, these last days? When the hospice work is gone, I do my best. And to me, this is the first sign to me. Um, I canceled two of the major things I was supposed to do, and that was the exact time that Beth needed me the most. She was already no longer lucid at this point. But um, being with her, the hospice care worker, and my family was just a grace-filled moment. And uh, this is the last time I had a chance to talk to Beth. I had gone after retreat and sat down, and I'd been told ahead of time, Beth did not want to be asked the question, how are you? So I didn't ask her. I said, hi, Beth. What you up to? <laughs> and uh, she laughed. And she, by now, she was bloated um, from all the medication and whatnot. And she was propped up with pillows. Um, and she just started chattering away like a typical 23-year-old. And then she said, uh, I was ready for anything but what she said. I thought she'd ask, okay, why is God allowing this? Nope. She said, Uncle Jim, would you play a game with me? I said, sure, what do you want to play? She said, I want to play 7-Up. 7-Up is a card game that my parents taught us and that we've taught the next generation. 
I said, sure. So she called her mom and dad over, her brother. We sat down and played. Not once did she want to talk in between hands about anything, and she ended up winning the game. <laughs> uh, and after the game, I said, now, Beth, I said, I have no idea what your energy level is like. Would you tell me when you want me to leave? She said, okay. So uh, at almost the two-hour mark, she looked at me and said, okay, Uncle Jim, time to leave. Bye. That was, <laughs> that was the last word she spoke to me. <laughs> I laughed and I said, well, Beth, thank you for being so direct. I wish people were like that. I said, okay, I'll be back tomorrow. Okay. Well, when I came back, uh, she had dipped into in and out of unconsciousness. She was in such so much pain that uh, her parents decided with, with her willingness to put her on more morphine. So the rest of the time I visited every night after work, we just sat and talked with parents and whatnot. And one night, Kathy, her mother, was literally in my face. She said, would you please ask God why? And I started to say something pastoral, and I realized this was not a good time to do that. <laughs> so I nodded my head, and uh, I didn't do it. <laughs> Came back the next night. What did God say? I said, I haven't asked you. And she repeated again. I could tell she was serious. So I said, okay. So the next morning in prayer, I'm just sitting there in silence. I said, Lord, I know you've never answered any of my why questions. And I teach people, don't ask why questions. <laughs> but would you do this for this mother who's losing her child? And I was stunned when a single word came to my heart, and the word was ready. Beth was ready. I couldn't wait to tell Kathy. I said, Kathy, you're not going to believe it. I really sense God saying something for you. What? Beth is ready. She's ready to go home. And that's her whole purpose of life here, is to explore and learn how to love and give and receive love. God's saying, you and Tom have done a great job. She's ready to go home. So Kathy was grateful for that. Then uh, when we prayed the final prayers of uh, Sacrament of Sick, um, I was kneeling down, and it was a time of laying on hands, and the family was gathered around her. And as I was praying, I, I had this... All I could call it is this, this real sensual vision um, that Jesus was lying across her body at an angle and weeping with the rest of us. I, I was stunned by it, the whole experience. So we finished celebrating the sacrament, and then I called Kathy to the side. I said, you're not going to believe what I just saw. And I described it to her, and she nodded her head and smiled, and said, I saw the same thing. Oh. Yeah, same thing. And I said, teasing her, I said, you don't need me anymore. <laughs> God's communicating to you directly. So stop asking me. You do it. <laughs> so she laughed. But God wasn't done with her yet. And so we got a false alarm and that the hospice had said that we would have about a two or three hour warning of when she would die uh, because her skin color would start to change, start to become blotchy. Um, and so we got a call at about 2 a.m. in the morning. And so we all rushed over to say some final prayers, but uh, she rallied back. She really did. Her breathing changed, shifted after we prayed with her. But as we were praying, I happened to look up and I saw Kathy's face. It was different. And um, she told me later, she said, I'm much better. She said, I saw my father. He died in 92. And he was grinning from ear to ear and he had his arms out welcoming back home. And her father had never met his granddaughter. She said, I know it's your time. I'm ready to let her go. And she was. Kathy's been fine since. I bring that up because in the darkness of their, our pain and suffering, God was in his presence. God doesn't abandon us. That's like saying the other side of the moon, just because we can't see it, has gone. As children, we think, so yeah, but it's not there, okay, it must not exist. All right? What God does with us and through us in times of deep suffering and darkness, no matter how it comes to us, is God is inviting us to grow deeper in the experience of what it means to be human. You know as I do, especially those of your parents or caregivers, you don't always have the answers to give your children. You don't know what to say or how to respond. Um, even in a relationship with friends your own age. And so it is that God teaches us that we'll never know everything about God, let alone ourselves. 
But here's where we've been misdirected. And I say this as a priest. Religious people like to make God obvious and understandable, to box God in. And most of us clergy do this through what we call control. That we just say the right prayers, go to the right services, do the right things, we got it made. We know God. Not true at all. Not true at all. In fact, it misdirects us because God is more hidden than revealed. God is more hidden than revealed. Because God is like a lover. God wants to be found out. So as much as Advent is a season of waiting, we're waiting for the coming of the Lord. Are you ready for this? Good thing you're sitting down. God is waiting for you. God is waiting for you to go down in the darkness of your own life. To find a deeper groundedness in a love that's large enough, deep enough, strong enough to carry for you. I'm grateful to be able to tell you that my family's in a very good place. When you face the darkness head on with humility, vulnerability, and openness, you come out on the other side with a deep appreciation, deeper gratitude and compassion. And can we use the word understanding of what is, acceptance of what is? Beth is, um, and I say this in the present, Beth is one of 24 cousins. And at her um, celebration of life party, three weeks before she died, her cousins came from all the United States. There's only one. Uh, he's in the military. He was in Kosovo, Kosovo, so he couldn't come. But they all got there, and they all were wearing... Uh, shirts with the, the number on that they were in birth order. Oh. And each family had a different color. Now, you need to understand, that's a lot of families. <laughs> but uh, they're going to continue when they get together to bring Beth's shirt with them, to remind them that her presence is still with them. That's what we're supposed to do with darkness. Not to lock it in a closet and say, I don't go there. No. The early Christians talked regularly about the death and suffering of Christ. And they also saw it as a model for how they were to suffer and to die. So think of all the stories in Scripture. The Exodus. Where we have the cloud and the pillar of fire in the darkness. We also listen to the language of the mystics when they speak about things like a terrible beauty or a luminous darkness. You see? Again, bridging the opposites. Why? Because God is mystery. Are you ready for this? And you are mystery. You think you know who you are. You don't. You have a glimpse of who you are. Much of who you are is unconscious. And why as life unfolds, you discover more and more of who you are. When you put in stressful situations or joyful situations, and you realize, wow, I didn't know I had it in me. You know, I could do that. Kathy is a different woman now because of her daughter's gift of dying. Death. She had never gone that before. The darkness of her own soul, daring to ask all the hard questions about God, and suffering, and humanity. It's a beautiful story told about a Cherokee chief who knew that his son had to grow into manhood. And so one night he took him out in the forest and he told him to sit in the circle and not move and that he would come back for him in the night. And the boy was only eight years old. What parent would do that? As you can imagine, as the boy sat there obediently like his father told him, he waited and he couldn't go to sleep because all the noises were new to him at night. He tried to look through the darkness, and he couldn't see a thing. And so his fear kept him awake. And then slowly, as the dawn began to break, he looked off in the distance. Something familiar about that shape. Is that a tree? Is that a trunk? What is it? 
It was his father, who had sat at a safe distance, who had had night vision and watched over his son all night long. Sometimes that's how God is present to us in the darkness. That's what the Creator taught Mary. And eventually every woman learns. But even when you feel like, does anybody really care? I'm suffering. This is painful to bring this child to birth. All that. God's at a safe distance. Not because, not because you've done something wrong, but God is teaching you, teaching us, how to trust the interior presence within you. We are to surrender to this love. There's a beautiful refrain from the song called uh, Dance to the Darkness, Slow Be the Pace, Surrender to the Rhythm of Redeeming Grace. So real prayer is surrendering to that grace that's already yours because you're God's beloved. It's about being vulnerable to this great love. This is real power. The power of vulnerability. This is what God models for us through his son Jesus. Gifting us the human flesh. God holds us in his silence. His words, the words of all the prophets, all the holy women and men of God, reveal just enough, but they also obscure. Just back and forth. Reading between the lines. What is God saying here? This darkness and light. So how can we come to do the ordinary, truly human thing? And that is to delight in the here and now in preparation for the hereafter. How can we delight in the fact that your life, my life, our life is like a beautiful, incomplete symphony? How can we celebrate the ecstasy of being complete and dance with delight, even in the rhythms of darkness? That is the task of a person of faith. So here's another question I have for you, and I give you these questions because that's the way Jesus taught. The questions are meant to stir the soul of the adult. So Mary carried Jesus within her own body for nine months. Her cousin Elizabeth carried John the baptism. An expectant mother, hopefully awaiting her child's birth, is a strong symbol of Advent. What do you carry? What do you bear? What is inside you that others may be waiting for you to deliver into the world? What do you carry? What do you bear inside you that others may be waiting for you to bring into the world? Maybe it's an artistic sense that you've hidden because you're comparing yourself to someone else. Maybe it's a bit of wisdom that you thought nobody really is interested. Or an insight or a deep sense of care or compassion or an idea for a new project or a new way of doing things. What is it you carry or bear? Would you take a few moments now and just write that in your journal and just do some reflection on it?